Hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Ed Ting, the Scope Reviews Guy, and I got contacted a few days ago by a club member who lives in the northern part of the state, a couple of hours away, who says he has a 4-inch F10 Celestron refractor on an alt as mount that he just wants to donate to me. So my friend John is going to head up there and pick it up. He's picking up another scope at the same time, and let's see what we get. And here it is, the 4-inch F10 Celestron Refractor. Uh, it, it's not a 4-inch F10 Celestron Refractor. It's a Mead 80mm, model number 312 from the late 1980s. That's okay, these were pretty good telescopes. And you know, when John was on his way back after picking up the telescope, he called me from the road and told me what happened. The telescope had been misidentified, as a 4-inch Celestron when in fact it's a 3-inch Mead. But anyway, uh, yeah, again, like I said, these were really good for the time, and Mead didn't make their small refractors during this time period. They brand labeled from Japanese suppliers, and they picked some pretty good ones. Depending on who you listen to, these were either brand labeled from Toa or from Carton. Now, I couldn't find any markings on this thing, but at least superficially, cosmetically, it does look similar to some cartons that I have seen in the past. If anybody knows for sure who made this, leave a comment below so we can all find out about it. Let's do a quick walk around outside. Good looking telescope, as refractors tend to be. 6x30 finder, inch and a quarter diagonal and eyepiece. These slow motion controls are constantly getting in the way. Uh, it seems like there is always one in the way when you're trying to find something. So this thing was made during a time just before certain things became standardized in common. So if you look here, there is a finder stock that the, that's not standard. So if you're looking to replace the finder or replace it with a red dot, you're probably going to have to take that off and use one of the existing holes or drill a new hole of your own. Uh, there is no Vixen dovetail mounting. This is a sort of a clamping mechanism. Those two inch and a quarter by 20 screws cinch up against the plate there. And sort of friction feeds uh, the tube to the cradle there. Your eyepiece tray, again, is another quarter inch by 20 screw that uh, goes through those three slotted holes. Um, I found those tended to move a little bit on me also as I was using the telescope. But overall, you know, pretty good for its time. The telescope has really nice optics. The star test is really, really good. And looking at the Moon and Saturn and Jupiter, it's pretty hard to fault this telescope. Um, on bright objects, you will see some chromatic aberration. That's that purple ring or halo around bright objects. But back during the time of this telescope, there were very few apochromatic refractors, at least none that people could afford at the time. So we didn't really know how good refractors could get. But barring the chromatic aberration, which is pretty mild since it's a pretty long focal ratio, uh, there's nothing really wrong with this. We could split double stars with it. You can do some basic deep sky. It's the summertime right now, so we could look at M13. We could look at the ring. We can look at the dumbbell. We could look at a bunch of globulars and Ophiuchus and M5 and M3 and the, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty good telescope. It's got an alt as mount, um, so it's pretty smooth in the motions. Um, by today's standards, still pretty good. I think I still prefer an equatorial mount, uh, especially since this thing isn't driven. If you're looking at Saturn or Jupiter at high power, it gets a little bit frustrating over time to keep tracking it using two axes as opposed to one with an equatorial mount. When I got the telescope, I called my friend Mike. He is our resident refractor expert. And I said, hey, Mike, I got a model number 312 Mead from the late 1980s. And he said, oh, I had one of those once. 
And by the way, that is not an unusual statement for Mike to make. And I said, really? So who'd you give that to? I recall you donated that someplace. And he told me who we donated the telescope to. And the name sounded familiar. And we started to piece together what happened to the telescope after he gave it to this person. And we put two and two and two together. And finally, I said, Mike, I, I think I have your telescope. And he says, yeah, I, I think you do too. So the life of a telescope. It travels several hundred miles with who knows how many stops in between, and it winds up at a place six and a half miles from where it started. So these days I rarely take a donation and keep it for myself. If I do take one, I usually have a place in mind where I can bring it or donate it to. It's either going to a local school or to a library, but I am a part of a charter program with an organization that's, from, that's uh, affiliated with the National Science Foundation. And one of our charters is to bring older, unwanted telescopes to rural places in Chile. Uh, Chile is one of the best places in the world to do astronomy, but they don't teach it there because of funding issues. So I was in Chile a couple of times, and I taught at local schools, and it was a really great experience. And we think we have a pipeline set up where we can bring this material in um, through scientific means and uh, not incur customs and shipping and that sort of thing. We think we have that set up, and this may be a good candidate as a pilot program to test that out to see if it works. So that may be where it goes. There you have it, a four inch F10 Celestron refractor on an Altaz mount that turns out to be something else. And not only that, there's an interesting story to go with it. I'm sure I'm gonna find some place to donate this to, a library, or a school someplace, or maybe a poor astronomer someplace looking to get started. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.